All right. Uh, still a little early, but um, I wanted to maybe just go ahead and uh, start saying a few things uh, since I have a few people here already. So, uh, you know, feel free. I want these to be a little bit more like help sessions. Um, you know, so this class is actually online, so we don't really have any kind of uh, regular face-to-face -face meeting or anything, but I'm going to try and do these uh, maybe Monday or Wednesdays, or I might go back to one day a week. We'll see. So, uh, but yeah, saying that, um, you know, let me know if, if you're here specifically for some uh, specific issues, you know, so if, if you have a question, probably other students have a question about things. So I had a couple of things I am going to go over here, although uh, it is 11 o'clock here, so I'll get started in a second. Um, but uh, yeah, and also somebody already told me that the audio and video um, seems to be okay, but, uh, you know, let me know. Uh, through chat or just to uh, unmute if um, if you can't hear or uh, if you have a question anytime or anything. So, and hopefully you guys can see my screen here too. I've got the uh, the class site uh, pulled up here. So um, I've got quite a few things I could go over here today. My plan was basically two. I kind of wanted to show uh, just a few hints about setting up the development environment. So that's kind of important. Um, um, uh, you need to get that set up. We do have a program assignment each week for the five weeks of this class. So you need to have that set up though today so you can get started working on them. The assignments are going to be due on Thursdays. Um, and um, But I also hopefully want to maybe have a little bit of time. I'll talk about the actual, the first problem set as well. So I want to talk a little bit about the hypothetical machine, see if anybody has any questions about that, say a few things. So, um, If you haven't gotten logged in to the site, make certain you've, you've done that, although I suppose uh, most people probably, uh, at least if you've gotten this far and got logged in, um, you should have been able to find our uh, MyLeo online site and got it in there. There's lots of stuff uh, you need to do. Uh, in particular, so, um, you know, make sure you read all announcements, uh, make certain um, uh, you look through the content. Uh, there is a syllabus. Uh, real quickly, um, we have five weeks for this course. Each week uh, I call a unit. So we kind of break the course up into five units. Uh, for each unit, we're covering two chapters of our textbook. You probably really are going to need this textbook. Uh, we're heavily doing like all the tests, all the questions and things are kind of coming from the textbook. Um, so each week we do two chapters from the textbook. So for this first week, we're going to be doing the first two chapters, one and two. Uh, there is kind of a, a schedule uh, at the bottom of the, um, an outline at the bottom of the syllabus here. Um, and our general structure for the course is every week we've got a written problem set that you're going to do. That's going to be due on Tuesday. So that the first one's due tomorrow. Uh, there's going to be a program assignment. Uh, those take the form of like a simulation of some aspect of an operating system. So the first program assignment is due on Thursday. So the problem sets are due on Tuesday. Program assignments are due on Thursday. Uh, and then we have a test which has some multiple choice true false, which is about half of the test. Uh, and then some written questions. They're similar to the problem set questions. Uh, those I um, you'll do that on Friday. Uh, so I'll open it up on Friday and Saturday at the end of the, each week uh, to work on those. Um, all right. And, and it's a pretty simple structure in terms of the assessments. Those are all worth equal amounts. So you end up with five programs, five problem sets, and five tests, uh, each worth, you know, um, uh, an equal amount for the total for the grade. So each ends up being worth about six and uh, six and two thirds points. So each one of those assignments is about half a letter grade. So, uh, yeah, that's all I wanted to say because I wanted to get into both things. But uh, you know, let me know if you have any question about the assignments or the structure of things. So, but yeah, for this week, the most important is you know, um, make certain you read through, do all these getting started tasks, and I want everybody to try to um, get your development environment set up today. Or if you can't do that, make certain you email me before you're done today with where you're at um, and why, what issue you're having. I'm gonna try and show a few things about that next year. So, um, but feel free to shout out questions once we get started on that. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and start on that. Um, 
basically to get started on that, you'll want to go to this link here to GitHub repository. Um, and I'm going to try and follow these instructions a little bit. Um, the, this should work on Windows or Mac. Um, it should work on both old Mac with Intel architect uh, hardware or newer Macs. If you got a newer Mac with the M1 or M2 uh, Mac hardware, uh, people have been doing it with both of those. So. Um, man, my brush is going all out already. I've kind of gotten gotten unused to talking, uh, <laughs> just being off for five weeks here. Uh, I didn't have a course for the first summer sessions. Um, um, okay, so um, I'm going to show some of these things. Feel free to jump in, you know, with questions about anything uh, at this point uh, about setting up your um, development environment. Um, I'm going to show uh, just a few things. I can't show everything, but I'm going to show a few things in a Windows environment. So things will be a little bit different if you're on Mac, but but you should be able to get them working uh, on e in either place. So for the development environment, you actually have to install three things. You have to get Docker installed because we're going to be using what are known as dev containers or development containers in Docker to do things. And it's really a requirement. You have to get this working in the development containers because we've got things set up um, for the programming assignments. We've got a, a build environment set up and tools set up for you uh, and test environments. So you really need to use the development environment that we set up for you. So, you know, the first thing you'll do is you'll want to go to this link here um, and download the Docker and install that on your system. Hopefully it'll be relatively simple. You can download it for Windows or for Mac with an Intel chip or Mac with the Apple chip. Um, and um, like I said, I'm kind of actually running this Windows environment in a virtual environment, so I can't show you everything, but like in Windows and in Mac, it's just a standard installer. So once you download it, you should be able to just uh, run the installer, however you normally run an installer um, on your own system. Um, and uh, for all of these, I think you can, except for forget, um, uh, you can usually just accept all the defaults that it gives you when you run the installer. Uh, don't know why that's taking some time to start here. Um, but um, most of these instructions on here on setting up your development environment are for Windows. Um, um, there's kind of two things. I don't know if this is an issue anymore, but like uh, like uh, a year ago or a couple months ago, um, you might have had you might have set some configurations on Windows to make certain that uh, Windows subsystems for Linux um, is like the default that Docker is going to be using. Um, so if you get a pop-up saying that um, um, that WSL2 installation is incomplete, you'll want to go ahead and click on that and follow the instructions to get your Windows subsystems for Linux set up installed for you. So um, another hint for uh, Windows people, you, you probably may need to make certain that virtualization is enabled. So if you've never gotten into the BIOS on your system, you'll have to reboot your system after installing Docker um, and check. So uh, when it's rebooting, you get into BIOS, usually you, you hit like a function key like F2 or sometimes F11 or F12, um, and there'll be a, um, a setting in your BIOS to enable virtualization, uh, uh, so hardware um, virtualization in there. So you need to make sure that's enabled. So th there's a couple of links here if you've never done something like that about some hints on getting into your BIOS and enabling that. So uh, I don't know why that didn't start up. Might be having issues already here. So anyway, so I wasn't really going to show much on installing the Docker. Oh, there it went. So um, Uh, yeah, so I, I just downloaded the most recent. So, you know, you do want to use the WSL2 uh, instead of Hyper-V. Uh, Hyper-V, I believe, isn't going to be working for us. You can or cannot add a shortcut and so on. So, um, and hopefully most people will have, won't have too many issues with Docker's now, with Docker install nowadays. Uh, the second one, I did have a couple of things, probably some better hints here. So the second thing you need for these development environments is you need to get Git installed. Git is a tool for doing um, um, software development. Uh, it's, it's mainly for a, a tool for working with groups. 
uh, but you're going to be working using it uh, in order to do your assignments and check in your code. So if you've never used Git before, it's not really a primary goal of this course, but you're going to learn a little bit about um, uh, cloning a Git repository and making um, commits and pushing those commits to the repository that kind of stuff. Uh, if you're a Mac, you probably already have Git installed. If you're Windows, you probably don't. You can check on Windows. Um, I always do stuff in the command line. If you've never done stuff in the command line um, on Windows, you can open up or um, search for like command um, and to open up a command prompt. Um, I use this often enough. I often just pin it to my taskbar. So that's why I've got uh, the... Uh, um, that's why I got the uh, um, my command prompt down here on my taskbar. So if you open that up, though, if you have Git installed on, uh, this should work on you know Windows or Linux or Mac. You can check whether you've got installed or not by opening up a prompt uh, and checking. Um, and you know if it's not installed, it's not going to recognize that as command. You'll have to install it. Um, so on Windows, you'll um, uh, you'll want to download from this link here. Um, uh, on Mac, if you don't have it installed, you'll probably want to use like uh, Brew or something like that. Um, I don't remember if I discussed that here. Um, but yeah, for Windows, you know, if you go to the, the Git You'll probably want the 64-bit. Uh, if you don't know whether you have a 32-bit or 64-bit, most people are up to 64-bit nowadays. So you want to install the 64-bit version. Um, and oh, my doctor's still going. Um, and let me go ahead and, and get start the the Git installer here. Um, so before you can do these next steps, uh, two and three, you have to have Git installed on your system. Let me let me let me show you installing Git here. There was one question that th this will cause some issues for people um, if you don't set your carriage return line feed endings correctly. Um, um, you'll have some issues when you try to do the assignments for this class here. So let me show that. Um, so once you install the once you start the installer on uh, Windows. Um, like all, all these things, um, you shouldn't get a warning here because I've installed Git before on the system. But all these things, you should be able to accept the defaults, except look for the one about um, choosing your um, um, line endings here, configuring the line ending conversions. Uh, just leave them as is. Check out is, as is, commit as is. Uh, because since we're using Docker, you're actually going to be developing stuff on a Linux environment. But um, your file system, if you're a Windows, uh, this probably only applies to people that are using Windows. If, if you're on Windows, it's going to be actually checked out in your Windows file system. But if you don't ch change that, it might change your line endings to Windows style. And that actually causes problems running certain things uh, when you're running it uh, in your uh, Docker dev container. Uh, for this class. So, so it's best to leave the line endings as is instead of having Git try and uh, convert those for you. Feel um, free if, if, uh, if, if, you know, anybody has a question about anything, you know, uh, type it out in the chat or just go ahead and unmute, let me know. Uh, the rest of these should be fine then. Like I said, everything else, you probably don't have to um, change uh, the defaults for it. Uh, and like I said, that that this that thing I was talking about for changing the the line endings probably doesn't apply for for Mac. Uh, Mac uh, uses Linux line endings anyway, so um, it wouldn't matter which which one you select if you're on a Mac environment. So uh, so the Git installer shouldn't take too long. Docker is pretty big. Uh, it's still, Docker still installing on my system here. Once you install Git, uh, whenever you install something, if you already have a terminal open, if you're not used to working with terminals, um, it won't see any updates that the installer does. So you'll need to, to you know, uh, exit out of that terminal and start a new one. That's why I, I quit that old terminal I had 
set up here. So I don't really want to launch the Git bash or view the release notes, but my Git should be installed now. So let's try back that here. Let's let's confirm that's installed. So I'll open up a new terminal. Oops. Um, so that's what you should see on Windows or, or anywhere if you have Git installed. If you run Git and ask for the version number, you should get a version. You probably won't get exactly the same version, but the most recent version of Git should be something like 2.41 something. All right. Uh, and then, you know, this is important stuff here. Some people skip this stuff, but uh, make certain that you do configure your Git um, on your host system. Um, and make certain that this email, oh, uh, I did skip something. So, um, um, uh, you should. Uh, you need to create a GitHub account if you don't have one. Um, I would prefer, if, if at all possible, that you use your TAMUC email address, but that's not that's not required. That that would give you the that would be the easiest on me. Um, so let me bring up Git real quickly here. So if you just go to GitHub.com, uh, you can uh, sign up to create a new account if you don't have it already. Um, I've already got an account created. Um, I'm just, this is my throwaway account I use for doing examples, uh, for doing Git stuff um, uh, with the username of TMUC student. So um, I'm going to come back to this, but once you've signed up, um, if you click over here on your icon, uh, you can get various things like your um, repositories and stuff, but also you'll find your settings down here. So um, what I was just talking about here, one of your settings is what your primary email is, right? So, you know, it'd be good if, if at all possible, if you don't have a GitHub account, it's fine if you've already been using GitHub and you need to keep it, your primary is some other email address. But um, if you can have your uh, email address be your leo.tmuc.email um, address, right? So not this, but, but your normal TMUC email address. Uh, but the other thing that I was getting to say, whatever you set as your email address, you definitely need to make certain that this corresponds to the configuration um, that I'm about to do here for git config. So um, uh, like here, uh, uh, once, once you've got git installed, you want to configure your global username and email. So I'll do those. Uh, uh, user.name. This doesn't matter so much, but, you know, go ahead and use your real name when you configure this. So uh, that's what it'll show up on Git when you push um, changes to Git, I believe. This is this is where I'll do it. Uh, but then definitely make certain you config the global user.email um to that email address that you set your github account to if you don't do this uh whenever you push a commit it won't show up correctly as being attributed to you um, in github right so for me uh, certain i copy and paste from here but um, i want that There we go, like that. Um, so whatever you have your email set up in GitHub, um, configure global, your Git global email to that. Um, I didn't show this in the instructions, but you can always check your global config settings by doing a dash global dash list to see the things. So, um, so you can check that you set those correctly in there. Uh, oh, and then fine, but then uh, this is also a very important step. A lot of this, this if you've never done stuff with secure shell keys, a lot of people mess this part up. You do have to generate uh, a key using this command. Um, uh, go ahead and just hit return on this. This will put the key, this is, this is the location where it's going to save your secure shell private key here um, into a subfolder called .ssh, into a file named id underscore rsa. Um, and don't enter a passphrase. If you know what you're doing, you can have a passphrase, but uh, this will cause you problems. So it's fine for now to just leave it with no password, no passphrase, right? 
Um, so as a result of doing that, uh, you should end up with a file. Um, if you look, um, uh, you know, again, if you're on Mac, this will be in your home directory. On Windows, your home directory is going to be something like uh, C colon users, um, your username. So I'm, I'm logged in as a user called Vagrant here. Uh, there'll be a .ssh, although on Windows, if you're using the file browser here, uh, you may or not may or may not be able to see uh, this is kind of like a hidden folder. So you might have to check the hidden items uh, to be able to see that. I'm not certain. Uh, inside of there, though, there should be, af after you do your key gen, uh, there should be a file called ID underscore RSA and a public one. This is this is the your public key of the public private key pair. So you actually need to copy this public key from here to um, GitHub. All right. So I'm just going to uh, edit that with a notepad here. So your, your public key um, um, just looks like a bunch of random digits. All right. But I'm just going to go ahead and copy that and go back to my GitHub account. Um, so another setting then you can do on settings is to uh, configure your SSH and uh, GPT keys. So in order to correctly commit assignments, uh, you have to have your GitHub account set up. Um, you have to have your, your secure shell key set up. So you need to do a new secure shell key and you need to uh, paste in that public key that I copied uh, uh, from there, All right? Uh, and should give it a good name. Uh, I mean, if, if this is the first time you've ever been trading keys, uh, it doesn't make much difference. But once you get using GitHub for a while, you might end up getting a collection of secure shell keys. Something like that. So this is my 430 summer two public commit key. All right. Again, feel free to shout out if anybody wants to stop me or ask a question about something. Um, so, uh, and this is a good thing to do because uh, um, if you don't have secure shell key, private key set up correctly, uh, this will cause problems later on when you try to clone the repository here. So uh, as a kind of final thing before you move on, um, check, um, that you can secure shell into GitHub with that key that you just generated. So again, from the command line. You should be able to do SSH to get at github.com. The first time you do this with a key, um, it's going to ask, uh, this will also avoid some problems that um, um, if you don't do this step from the command line and you try to clone from inside of VS Code, uh, it will fail because it's, it's asking you that you want to continue connecting. But it, for, I think I think this might be a bug in VS Code. Uh, it doesn't really show you this. It just kind of fails silently. Right. So that, the first time you ever use a, a key, um, it has to to kind of secure shell has to remember that this is an authentic key for um, different reasons here. So you do need to answer yes the very first time. Only the first time you ever do this does it kind of need to know whether this is the right host uh, or not you're trying to connect to, right? If you connect su successfully, you should get a message about, uh, you know, hi, your GitHub username, you've successfully authenticated to GitHub, right? And like I said, if you do that again, uh, it shouldn't ask, uh, uh, a second or subsequent time, whether you're sure that that's the right host you meant to connect to. So you'll just get the um, um, the message about successfully authenticated. All right. So um, anyway, so let's get. So, so you have to have um, Docker installed. You have to have Git installed and set up. And you have to have your secure shell. Um, public private key created um, and your GitHub account are created, right? So that's all the first two steps. And the third step is to uh, install VS Code Editor. Um, so you can download that from that link um, and you know, download the installer that you need for your system 
right? Um, again, for uh, VS Code, um, I believe you can just accept all the defaults if it asks you for any uh, when you install your VS, uh, VS Code uh, IDE. So VS Code, if you've never used it before, it's a, it's a good tool to learn how to use. Uh, it's a basically an integrated development environment. Um, so I don't know if you get that message about not being meant to run as as the uh, administrator, but you can go to said yes, and of course accept the agreement and just accept the defaults, I believe. Um, So anyway, uh, you'll uh, you'll again. This is not a primary goal of this class, but uh, VS Code is a good tool to use. It's become pretty popular. Um, it's it's more than just an integrated development environment. So it's really more of a framework for plugging in development tools. So uh, compilers, but also uh, testing frameworks and uh, lots of other stuff. So it's a pretty flexible. It's, it's an extensible development environment. Uh, all right, so if you get this code installed, it should launch for you. Um, okay, and I can't really run dev containers uh, in here, so I'm going to actually switch over to my VS Code on my native system. But um, uh, at this point, I mean, that should be all the setup. So um, I'm going to show you actually doing the practice assignment. I'm, I'm just going to do it real quickly here. There's more in the video about doing some steps here, but um, uh, I'll show you what it should look like. Ho hopefully I've got everything set up correctly here. So that's kind of what the, the rest of the things are, are getting you started. But then the, the next thing you'll want to do once you get VS Code and Git and Docker set up is to try to get the uh, practice assignment to, to, to practice doing the workflow um, completed. Try and do that today here if you can. So. Uh, so let me go back to let me go back now to um, um, setting up uh, your your environment here. Um, so the first thing you'll need to do is uh, you'll need to click on this link here. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that link to get started on the on any assignment. There'll be a invitation link for the assignment. Um, so this is the invitation link um, for the practice assignment uh, down in the getting started area here. Um, oops. I have one or two people already got past this point. So, um, oh, um, yeah, make certain you select your correct name. Let me know if, if, if it's not showing up there. That means somebody incorrectly selected uh, the name, that they, uh, the, the wrong name here. I forgot to add a name for myself. So uh, give me just one second here. So, um, sorry about that. Uh, Yeah, I see a lot of people. Hopefully, this. Hopefully, I'm not. Uh, uh, hope it's okay. Should I see quite a few people linked? That's great. Well, maybe half of you so far. So that's good. Um, all right, back to this. I'm gonna have to redo this here. So when you accept that assignment link, you should see. Make sure you select the right name, and just accept the assignment. So um, what this does is this actually creates a GitHub repository for you um, and populates it with from a template for the assignment. All right. So if you want to, you can just um, uh, 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 it takes a little bit of time. Actually, it, only, it should only take like five or ten seconds. If you just reload, you'll get a link to your repository that's that should you should have read write access to this. Okay. So you can just click on that. 
or also as another hint, I mean, if, if you go, if, if you, you know, leave um, and, and later come back, uh, some people have trouble finding that. So the way to find that, it, it's not going to show up. So, so if you're getting to GitHub um, and you click back over here, oops, um, So um, if you look at your uh, repositories, you actually won't see it. So that confuses that confused me the first time I did this here. Uh, the, the repository that's created for these assignments is actually going to be in what's known as an organization on GitHub. Um, so you, uh, again, unless you've been using GitHub, you probably only have the organization that was just created for you, uh, which should be the 430 OS summer 2022. If you look in that, um, and look at, um, oh, sorry, 2023, I meant. Um, uh, so I gave it the, the 430.01W, your section OS summer 2023. Um, but yeah, if you look at that, that's where you'll find the repository if you need to get back to it from GitHub. All right, um, so uh, for this part of the assignment, you'll wanna follow these steps here uh, once you've accepted the, uh, the, the practice assignment. Uh, these are the, the steps to follow, the pre-step and configuration. Uh, you know, so you should have already created your GitHub account um, and um, set up your SSH key um, uh, and done these steps, uh, you know, installed VS Code and had the Docker set up. Um, and accepted the assignment. So let's, let's go ahead to the, the step of cloning the repository. Um, so to do this, uh, the way you clone a repository is on GitHub, um, up here under the code near the top on your code tab, uh, you should see ways to, to clone the repository. You wanna clone it using SSH, okay? If you clone it using HTTPS, this is a read-only clone, but you need to be able to, to actually uh, write code and then push your commits back so I can see them. So the way I grade stuff for these assignments is you actually have to push them back to GitHub. And the way to do that is you have to clone it using SSH. And that's why you had to set up an SSH key uh, for these things here. So I'll just copy that key here um, and I'll start Visual Studio Code and go ahead and clone that, okay? So the way I normally clone a new repository for these assignments um, is I go to the sub um, the source control on the left-hand side here um, and do a clone repository. And then you just paste that git um, SSH uh, URL uh, to clone the repository, right? And hit return. Don't, don't do clone from GitHub. That doesn't uh, quite work the way that, that we want it to. So, so do, just do it clone from URL. Um, let me just show that again, clone repository. Uh, uh, or actually just, just type in the URL um, um, in the box here. Um, and, and clone it from that URL. So, um, make certain that you select a location on your local file system to clone the repository into. So this is basically going to download the contents of your repository onto your, your local machine, your host machine. I always put all my repositories in a subfolder on my home directory called repos. So I'm just going to select and put it there. I suggest you do that, do the similar thing, have a special directory to put all your repositories in on your local machine into. Um, so once it clones it, you want to open up that folder. And if you have if you have Docker set up correctly, so if you don't have Docker and dev containers working, you won't get this message. But if you do have it working, you should be able to reopen it in a container. And that's what you want to do. So this will actually reopen it in a Docker dev container. So I'm in my correct development environment. So I'm actually in a Linux environment with all the build tools and the compile tools and the testing tools that you need for the assignments for this class here, right? The first time you do this, um, it will take some time to download some stuff and configure some stuff. So, 
but yeah, if you don't get that message to reopen in a dev container, you probably don't have Docker set up correctly or some other issue. Okay. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention on this video so far, but um, you know, um, feel free. Um, I, I am going to probably be on campus um, in my office in the science building, uh, room 355. So if you are local, uh, like Mondays and Wednesdays, I've kind of set aside uh, kind of around lunchtime. I'm going to try and do these uh, help sessions. Uh, but yeah, if you prefer face-to-face -face, uh, sometime around there, if, if you need uh, me to look at something, I can do that. Or, you know, it, uh, this is a online course, uh, so feel free to email me and we can set up an uh, email for like a personal Zoom face-to-face uh, -face if need be for things. So, um, all right, so it's almost done here. So once it's done, you should... Uh, should stop kind of getting messages out here and you should see that you get a bunch of files and yeah, once it comes to here it, the, the docker container should be up and running um if, if you look at your not extensions if you look at the the remote explorer uh you should now find that you've got a dev container um and the green check mark means that it's actually connected to that dev container for your assignment zero zero um Okay, so we just did the, the step to clone repository and we reopen it up inside the dev container. Um, so you want to make certain that the uh, uh, that the build system is working uh, is your next step here. So um, if you're having problems, uh, you can always, uh, we're using a, a simple tool called make um, uh, for, for building, um, for, for managing the project build here. Um, so you can always, use from a terminal uh, to check whether your, your build system is working or not. So, so if you do like terminal, new terminal, it should open up a terminal for you inside your dev container. Um, and you should be able to run the, the commands uh, for, for make. So if you do make help, it'll show you all the targets that you can do with make. Um, our normal workflow um, to build your code and test it is um, you can always do a make clean if you're having problems to just remove everything and do a clean build from scratch. Uh, but you, you don't have to always do a make clean. Um, so, so if things are okay, usually the first thing you do is do a make or the default target is to make everything. So you can just say make um, without saying anything or you can say make all. If you don't specify all, um, it does the, the, the default target and make all by, by default. So. Um, so what you want to look out for here is that it actually does build and compile everything, right? So um, um, if you've never, you know, done stuff, we are using C++ for this class. It's a requirement. The project has to be done in C++. We're actually using the GNU C++ compiler. So G++ is the GNU C++ compiler. So um, all, all this doing here um, is, you know, it compiles um, the, the C, some CPP source files into what's uh, known as an object file, right? Um, and then, but also in some places, it links together some object files into executables. So we create two executables for all of our assignments. We create one executable called test, which runs the unit tests. Um, and we create another executable called sim, which does the full simulation, which is what we're really doing for these assignments is we're building a simulation of some aspect of the operating system here. Right? Um, and then you can run make, um, uh, make unit tests uh, to run the unit test to see if you haven't started running, writing any code, make unit test should, um, um, apparently I'm getting the same thing other people, I had two people um, email me about this already. So I think in my video, it was showing something different. So right now some tests do run, uh, but they're just all failing, okay? And I'll come back and show that here, but um, I guess this is what you should be seeing for the current version of this practice assignment zero. If you do make the unit test, it should run, but, um, uh, uh, all, most all, all the tests will be failing here. So I'll try to run some tests, um, but um, um, well, actually some are passing, but but a lot of them are failing. So, but, but I guess that is the, the, the normal thing you should expect. Um, 
when you first check out your assignment zero here today. Um, All right. Oh, and, and I, I, I normally don't type these from the command line. You can always do that. But I, I, I usually like to set up uh, keyboard shortcuts um, in Visual Studio Code um, in order to do my bake clean, my make all, and my make of the, uh, the, the unit tests. Um, I don't think these are set up by default for you. Um, so I usually use uh, Control-Shift-C uh, to make clean. Oh, um, I might not mention this. In the um, in the um, uh, instructions, but I don't think those keyboard shortcuts work uh, unless you're in in the uh, context of the editor. So you have to have the um, a file uh, editor focus. So um, So, so yeah, uh, oh, um, yeah, it's working for me. Control Shift C, I usually use for make clean. Control Shift, uh, it's probably working for me because, yeah, I've, I've set up Visual Studio Code before. And then I usually use Control Shift B to do the make all. Uh, and then Control Shift T will run the unit test. Uh, if, if those aren't working for you and you like to have the command line shortcut set up, I think I, I talked about this a little bit on there. But what you need to do is um, there's a file. Uh, in um, the dot GitHub directory, um, no, sorry, the dot VS Code subdirectory called um, keybindings.json, right? So uh, this is how Visual Studio Code sets up things that uses these JSON files. So anyway, these are the key bindings for Control Shift C to uh, run the make clean and so on, right? You actually need to copy this. From here, it doesn't use these by default. It, there's the key bindings are just there's one global key bindings file for Visual Studio Code. So if you if if you copy these, uh, and uh, the way to do those is is you go over here to the the gear icon for your settings, go to the keyboard shortcuts, um, and um, you can uh, or is it you can open the 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 keyboard shortcuts file here. Right, so this is actually the global keyboard shortcut JSON file. If you open that up, right, so you'll see I've because I already copied those over. But if you don't have those key bindings, you can copy them from where I gave them to you uh, here in VS Code. Uh, just copy these, Control C, uh, and then paste them into your key bindings JSON file here, right? Once you do that, I think it picks it up immediately. So once you do that and save the file, uh, and then again, if you're in uh, 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 the editor focus, th those key bindings only work when you're in like a file that you're editing, then you should be able to, to do the, the main ones. Control Shift C to do a make clean, Control Shift B to do your make all, Uh, and control shift T to run the test. All right. Another thing, though, we are using a a testing framework. Um, um, so the the testing framework um, extension should be installed for you um, already, I believe. Uh, so um, you should see a, a a little flask like a, a chemistry beaker here if your testing framework installation is installed. So another way to run the unit test is to bring that up. Um, and um, select up here to rerun all the tests. This actually runs them within, you know, this extension here. So what you'll get um, is some markup uh, in the um, assignment one test like, like file here, right? So um, all these like check false, check true. Um, uh, I talked a little bit more about it on the video. I probably won't be able to have time here to talk about these. So you can watch the video for a little bit more about these, but uh, this is using our um, um, C++ testing framework um, for these things here, but you, you can see which ones return, which ones failed with this markup if you run it from the testing uh, framework here, right? So we, we're expecting that four should be uh, uh, not prime. Um, so, so we're expecting to return false, but it's actually returning true as if four is a prime number here when we called the is prime function.
All right. Um, yeah, and I kind of want to wrap up. I mean, if, if you get that far, you pretty much leave. Um, uh, I'll show you kind of one more thing about actually uh, creating a commit and pushing it to the repository. So, you know, this isn't a real assignment. I actually give you the the, the code, right, um, uh, in order to get the test to pass here. Uh, but um, uh, when you do the, the real assignments for the class, you're going to be doing these same kind of steps. So you're going to be um, accepting the assignment, um, uh, cloning the repository uh, with your SSH key, Making certain that everything builds correctly, um, and then and then at that point you're ready to actually start on the assignment itself, right? So all the assignments will have a set of tasks. Uh, like the first task on this practice one was to implement the is prime function. So, uh, like I said, I'm, um, uh, the the um, I guess. Um, Um, so my video might be a little bit off. I, I might not have given you uh, this uh, when I talked about in the video, but it looks like my current version of the practice assignment. There's already a stub function for is prime, right? So, so I, I might that that might be. I'm not certain why I put this in here like this, but um, uh, yeah. So the 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 current version that you get there, there's a a function in primes.cpv called is prime, but it always just returns true, right? Um, and um, there's a function, uh, there's a, uh, a file called primes.hpp, which has the function signature for is prime, right? So for some of the assignments I give you, uh, you actually have to add the function yourself. So you wouldn't actually have um, um, these in here. I think that's what I was talking about on the, um, um, the example video that I gave you. Um, oops. Uh, uh, but let, let me move on. So I, I can show you what I mean by that. The, there's actually two functions for this practice assignment. So anyway, uh, uh, what you all have for the current practice assignment is you do have the stub function. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's expected that if you give it a, an integer number, it's going to return true if that number is prime. Um, and, and returns false if it's not. So seven is a prime, so it should return true, but like uh, eight and, and nine, nine is not prime, nine is divisible by three, so it should be returning false, right? So that's why these, these things are failing because it's always returning true in the stub that we give you. But if you were to actually write an implementation for is prime, you know, so there, there is, you know, uh, an example implementation here. Um, we can just copy and paste this. This is just a brute force implementation. that basically checks for every possible value of divisor from two up to the value that you're checking whether it's prime or not. And if it finds any number that's equal, that's evenly divisible by zero, that means that, that that number is a divisor. So the number isn't prime. So it returns false if it finds any number that's divisor. So just a, a very basic brute force way of checking if a number is prime or not. So if you put that code in though, um, it should, if you recompile, so I do a control shift uh, uh, C to, to clean everything, control shift B to recompile everything from scratch. And uh, control shift T to run my test. So you should, uh, once you put that in there, see that all the tests run, or likewise, if you do it from the, the testing framework extension, you'll see everything's green, which is what you wanna do for each task here, right? So we've actually completed task one for this practice assignment by uh, writing our is prime implementation, right? So what you need to do, uh, it's a requirement that um, every task that you're given for the assignments, you have to make at least one commit per task. You can have more than one commit, but, but you need at least one commit for each task. So the way to make a commit um, is you go back to the um, source control um, and you'll see that, that um, um, any file that you make a change to uh, in the source control tab and VS code will show up as having a diff here, right? So at the moment, I, I changed just one file, primes.cpp, which originally just had the stub function to return true, uh, to now having an actual implementation, right? So it actually tests all the advisors and returns false if the, if the value is not prime and returns true if, it, if 
the, the value is prime, that is testing, right? So what we're gonna do uh, to make a commit is we're going to um, stage this change. So, so we're gonna change, st stage uh, my changes to that one file, um, and then we're gonna actually uh, make our commit here, right? Um, uh, to make a commit, you do need to provide a commit message. Um, uh, I do ask people to practice good commit messages. So um, a good commit message always has a title. Um, and then it has one or more sentences of description. That's at least a, that's a minimal commit message. So we implemented... a brute force search for dividers of the value uh, to test if the ask for value is prime or not, whatever, something like that, right? So, you know, it, it's a it's little, little picky. I'm just trying to get you into good habits if you never used Git before. So it's considered good form to have a title, a blank line, and then, you know, a couple lines of description. So once you stage the changes you want to commit, added a commit message, go ahead and do commit. At this point, you've actually made a commit locally um, in your um, dev container. So you'll want to like sync those changes. So hit push this or down at the bottom, you can also push down here to push or sync your changes, right? So what this does is this actually pushes, I, I can't really see any work you do until you make a commit and push it to GitHub. So once you do that, if you go back and look at GitHub, um, where you'll see what one way, one place you can see uh, changes that you commit. Um, if you go to your pull requests, um, there should be a feedback pull request uh, created for you. If you look on there, um, you should see every time you push commit, it might take a few minutes, a few 20, 30 seconds to show up, but you should see the commit that you created, and once you push it or sync it, uh, it'll show up here on your feedback pull request. And this is this is what I see when I'm grading your work here as well, right? And in particular, right, you should see your title, and if you want to see the, the complete description, you can expand it out, right? Another thing you want to check, um, sometimes, you know, um, um, things can be, your, your test can be passing correctly locally, but maybe you forget to commit a file or some other issue, um, so every time you make a push uh, of a commit, it's good to go ahead and check because the, the same tests are being run um, on GitHub for you, right? But but sometimes because of issues, um, um, they might not be cleanly running on GitHub, even though they're running cleanly on your uh, VS Code in your dev container. So you want to look down here um, for the checks uh, and open up the details uh, and check that it's running, right? So what you'll see normally for the assignments is uh, every task will have a, a set of unit tests, right? So at this point, there's two tasks for this practice assignment. We're actually passing task one, uh, but we're failing task two, which is what you expect. And there'll be a grade down here, right? Um, all right, and then one final thing, like I said, nobody's asking questions yet, but, uh, uh, let me show you one final thing. So for the second, uh, I probably had this in my um, uh, practice video for assignment zero, but yeah, it must have been before. Uh, even task one didn't have a um, a stub function, right? So if we want to, if we want to actually do the second task, so if you want to complete all of assignment um, um, uh, of this practice assignment. Uh, we need to, so, so normally for these unit tests, for the assignments, I have them undefined. So we have to, if I want to work on my second task, I have to define task two. So that will actually enable these tasks. So the, the second task on this practice assignment is to create another function called find primes, right? So by enabling that, if you try and re, redo a build now, so I'll do it, go ahead and do a clean control shift C. Uh, control shift B to do a make all, uh, but it will fail because now that I've enabled those tests, it's expecting that there's an implementation somewhere of a find primes function, uh, but we actually don't have that function yet, right? So we actually have to, to uh, so what I normally suggest, you have to do this for some of the assignments for the functions I ask you to do. 
uh, I normally suggest that you first start by putting in a stub function to make certain everything can cleanly compile still um, and run, right? So for find primes, you have to find the signature. So find primes is expecting uh, two integers and then a Boolean, right? And it's returning an integer result, right? So it returns an integer result that we expect to test uh, in, in, in our tests here. So that means that I have to have another function called find primes with that signature. Um, so we need to start by um, in our include files, um, I have to add the prototype Um, something like that, right? So in this case, I'm kind of doing this from memory, but basically um, what's expected here, you know, we'll get, this is described in the assignment description, but, you know, kind of looking at the test here, we're expecting that the function name is find primes. It takes two integers as input. This is actually the start and the end of a range here. So, so I, I uh, specify two integer parameters as my first two input parameters. Uh, and then a Boolean true or false, uh, which is a flag here for my third parameter. Uh, and then it should be returning an integer result, which we test here, which is a count of the number of primes that it found in the range that you asked to search for. Uh, but this is just the function prototype. So to actually, uh, all function prototypes go in the header files for these assignments. And in general, that's the way things work in C++. If you've ever done a multi-file project, um, but uh, um, we need to actually have an implementation. Uh, it's it's uh, you should try and remove meta comments like write your uh, implementation here, like I just did. If I ever give those to you in the code, right? Uh, but back to what I was saying. So in this case, um, um, you know, don't don't write too much code. So don't try and do an input. Make certain that everything is, is back to compiling and running the tests before you start thinking about how you're going to implement it, right? So in this case, um, I just need a function that takes those parameters. I can ignore them and it needs to return an integer. So I'll just return a, a zero. So I'll just stub out the function. And I'll make certain that it compi it's compiling and running the test again. It won't, it won't be passing the tests, uh, but it should be compiling and running them, right? So we'll do a, a control shift C to clean. Control shift B. So now notice we don't have any compilation errors. So it actually builds everything. Um, and then you know, if we run the tests, control shift T, oops. Uh, it actually runs the test, but you know, um, they're not, they're they're failing. So um which we expect, right? Because uh, so if I run the uh, uh, the test in the testing framework. The first test that fails is this one because we're returning zero and expecting that there's nine primes in the range from one to 20. So. All right. And, you know, just one final thing, because I do want to move on. So it's going to be your last chance if anybody wants to ask a, like a quick question here. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, if I wanted to, I could commit. I'm not quite done with the second task for the assign the practice assignment, but I could go and commit. So now this now I actually made three changes. Uh, I changed, I added a line to the the header file for my new function prototype, added a line to the source file, or, or added the, the stub implementation to the, the prime.cpp source file, um, and we uh, defined the uh, the task two test. So we enabled the task two tests by just changing that from undef to define here. Right? So if you want to, I mean, you can stage these only the files that you want, but I want to stage all these. So I'll just go ahead and click the plus uh, by the, on the changes line that I'll actually stage all three files. Um, um, and then I'll create a, a, a commit message. Um, that we, you know, we're not complete yet with task two, but we complete our step function. So it should be compiling and actually running the tests. Um, and I'll commit it and push it. Again, just to show you that if you do that, uh, we should see it show up here. So you just saw it pop up there. Again, it should only take you know five, 10 seconds or so. Um, 
And it will take a little while, though, before the check runs. Uh, in fact, uh, if you do this too quickly, it might still be doing the the the, the check for the previous test. So um, just be aware of that. All right. Um, any kind of quick questions on that? You should try and get that far today on getting your development environment set up. And if you can't do that, you need to send me kind of your status or ask for help on getting things uh, this set up so you can get this far. So you can then begin working on the actual assignment one, you know, like tomorrow sometime or no later than Wednesday, I would suggest. So, yeah. so you know, if you get all the tasks working for assignment, you should see them end up all passing on GitHub when you push your final task. Um, and you should see that you get 100 out of 100 on the auto grader. All right. And let me emphasize again, you know, I won't, I'll make you redo the assignment. If you don't, you need to have at least one commit for every task. So most of the assignments have like four or five, six tasks. So at a minimum, you're going to have four or five or six commits, one per task. And you really shouldn't move on to like task two until you get task one completed um, and all the tests uh, passing for that task. So most of the time for these assignments, the the, the subsequent you know functions or the subsequent subsequent tasks depend on the previous one to be working before you can actually work on the next one. All right, last ch chance if you want to ask a question about the practice assignment. Otherwise, um, it is 12, but I think I'm, I'm going to spend five or 10 more minutes on one other thing, unless anybody wants to jump in for something. So, um, so your actual first thing, you know, so that, that first uh, assignment um, is actually due um, on Thursday. So all the assignments are, are usually due on Thursday of each week, all, each, each of the five assignments. But there is something before that. Um, there's a, the, I call them problem sets. These are actually written questions. So your first problem set, um, um, for this one, you should go ahead and just download this file that I gave you um, and just fill in um, the thing here. So what I'm expecting is that you fill in the contents of the registers um, and the uh, and memory as you do these things here. So I have a whole video about the hypothetical machine. Um, our first simulation is actually uh, 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 implementing. So our first program assignment uh, is implementing this hypothetical machine on on code. So so it's good to do this by hand to understand more about the the first program assignment. All right. Um, so like I said, I had a video uh, where I talk about some examples of the hypothetical machine. Um, this is directly from, uh, is it chapter one or chapter two of our textbook? Oops. Just bring up my textbook here. So, um, so I go a lot more into this into some of the videos that I gave here. But you know, the hypothetical machine is is to make certain you're familiar with the basic ideas of the fetch execute instruction cycle. Uh, and the hypothetical machine given in our textbook um, only has three instructions. So I actually added some extra instructions. So be, be, besides the load, store, and add instruction. Um, if you look at the uh, uh, at the at the the top here, um, um, I, I gave you the load store and add, uh, but I also added in a I gave a subtract instruction, and I also threw in some jump instructions for you, right? Um, and there's some other stuff in here, you know. So, but uh, you know, basically, you have to fill out um, what I uh, the 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 problem set. Uh, sheet that I gave you uh, to, to execute the to perform the fetch execute um, hypothetical machine stages by hand, right? So, I, like you know, this is the example from the textbook that um, initially the program counters at three hundred, 
right? So all you need to, to do for the fetch stage is whatever the program counter is saying, you're going to go hit memory and fetch that value from memory into what's known as the instruction register, right? So that's why 1940 gets fetched from here into our instruction register. And then the execute stage is basically you look at whatever is in the instruction register and you have to decode it um, and then execute that instruction, right? So the, um, the format... Um, is given our textbook for the uh, instructions. So the first four bits represent the opcode, right? Uh, and, and the rest of the uh, 12 bits of the six, this is a 16 bit machine here. The, the other 12 bits represent an address, right? So if you know your hex, these are actually hexadecimal if you didn't realize that, right? So if you know your hex, uh, one hex digit represents four bits, right? So the first um, hex digit here represents the first four bits. So this is going to be a binary 0001 is in the first four bits here. And then the next three digits represent the other 12 bits in this hexadecimal value, right? So this represents the address that's being um, uh, referenced here, right? So uh, so since, since we have one in the first four bits, uh, that decodes to a load instruction. So that means, and that's what's being shown here, um, that uh, we need to hit memory again, we're going to load whatever value is out in memory at address 940, and that gets loaded, you know, gets transferred from memory to the accumulator. So that's what a load does, right? Um, and then like an add. So oh, and another thing I, I skipped over, but uh, implicitly, you should do this the same way the textbook shows it. So implicitly, uh, the normal operation for the fetch execute cycle is that after you fetch a value, we implicitly increment the program counter by one in this hypothetical machine, right? So notice the, that the program counter was incremented to 301 because now after I execute this load here, I do my next fetch execute cycle. Um, so, but now the program counter is pointing to 301 because the normal way to execute a program um, at this level of a machine is to do it sequentially, right? So we execute the uh, uh, the um, instruction at memory address 300 first, then we're gonna execute the next instruction at memory address 301, right? That's, so that's what we do here. We, we fetch the instruction from memory address 301 to our instruction register. It decodes to a five, which is an add instruction. Um, and implicitly for an add for this machine, um, the, um, the address references um, a value in memory, which is two. We need to add that to what's in the accumulator. So we end up getting two plus three for the add. The result goes back into the accumulator. So we get five uh, the, as a result of doing this add, you know, of adding two plus three. Okay. Um, and again, the instruction register gets incremented to 302 here. Right. And you just keep doing that. Right. Um, so it's finally, this is, uh, you know, so pay attention down to here. These are some hints, but basically for all, I give you like four or five um, different starting points, you know, but you should have all the information you need. I gave you four uh, for this class here. So, you know, you have to, to just fill this in by, you know, so they, I think they all start at with a program counter of 300. So you'll be fetching this instruction, um, uh, from memory 300 into the instruction register, then you'll be decoding it and executing it, right? So um, for some of these programs, there, there's only like, you don't have an instruction at 303. So uh, after you do three fetch execute cycles, you might end up with your program counter um, at 303, but you don't have that instruction. So if, if you ever get to that point where the instruction register or sorry, where the program counter is 303, but you don't, ha don't have that value, you're done at that point. You might not fill in all of these cells is what I'm saying here. And so that was one of the things that's mentioned here. But the other thing is, um, so let me just mention, so these, these cause some people problems. I did add in some jumps, right? So the effect of a jump um, is, um, you know, like when we did an add like here, uh, the effect of an add was to um, implicitly do something with the accumulator. So, so an add adds some location memory to the value in the accumulator and stores the result back in the accumulator, okay? So if you get a jump instruction, like, like for example, if it says jump to address 941, a jump is an example of a type of instruction. Our, our textbook talks about different 
types of instructions. So th this is a, a flow of control instruction. So that that's uh, jumps are how you implement like if statements or loops uh, in a higher level language, right? So, so if, if I have something that says like jump to 941, uh, we're not gonna put the result in the accumulator, a jump to 941 actually changes the program counter instead of the accumulator, right? So if you execute a jump, um, you'll be changing. So instead of incrementing, uh, if I perform a jump to 941, the accumulator should show, the, the program counter should show 941 after successfully performing the jump, all right? Um, and then uh, I actually gave you those some conditional conditional jumps, right? So if it's an absolute jump, you just always perform the jump. So the way you actually implement like uh, condition statements, if statements uh, in a high level language is you usually use conditional jumps, right? So for example, uh, if uh, I, I gave you at least one or maybe two conditional jumps you have to simulate for our first problem set, right? So if you have a, a jump, to address if the result was zero, what you're going to do is you're going to look at the accumulator. So if the accumulator is zero, you perform the jump. And if the accumulator is non-zero, then you wouldn't actually perform the jump. You would just do the normal increment of the program counter as if the jump didn't, didn't occur, right? So that's how a conditional jump works. All right. Um, I think that's it. Did anybody kind of want to ask, was there any questions on the problem set that you have for tomorrow? So make certain, um, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm going to kind of be wrapping up here. You know, we've, we've got tight schedules. You can't really have late work. Uh, if you miss a, a deadline, you know, you're just going to miss the point for the assignment. So you really do need to keep track of, keep on top of things. On assignments, um, since we, you know, we have no margin for kind of uh, slack uh, on doing things, right? Um, so I really encourage you, you know, the, the, the structure is that I, I encourage you, um, like in the first week, you do need to get, do a little bit of time today, setting up your development environment, but I encourage you to uh, do the readings and at least get started on the problem set today, and then finish up the problem set tomorrow and uh, submit it. And you should get started on the, the program assignments like on Tuesday and Wednesday um, and then try and finish them up on like Wednesday. Um, and then, like I said, I, I leave aside like um, uh, Friday and Saturday, or sorry, finish, try and work out on Wednesday and you have to submit the program assignment by Thursday. Uh, and then concentrate on, uh, you know, doing some review and study for the test on Friday. And you take the test on Friday or Saturday, um, but the, the tests are due uh, by the end of the day on Saturday. Now, all the assignments are due by midnight. I'm going to try and get the assignments back the next day, right? So the, the problem sets, since they're due on Tuesday, I'll probably be grading them Wednesday morning. Program assignments, since they're due on Thursday, I'll probably be grading them uh, Friday morning. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording, although I can stick around uh, for a few more minutes if anybody wants to ask a, a question, uh, but that's it. Um, I am gonna be posting these Zoom sessions um, um, on, on YouTube. I have a playlist for that. So I'm gonna try and get that up here next, uh, but that's it for today. I'll go ahead and stop the recording here. Send me emails if you have questions. I'm also available um, for face-to-face -face stuff if you're on campus, if you want things. Uh, but otherwise, um, uh, keep sending me your questions, and I'll see you guys later then.